Well, praise. Well, praise God. Welcome to Westside Tabernacle Church. Uh, looking forward to being in church with y'all again. Amen. God is good and greatly to be praised. All right. I guess we'll start off. Anybody got any special prayer requests they have? Anybody? No special prayer, prayer requests? So we'll go ahead and go in prayer. Uh, also for like an announcement, uh, one of the brothers been coming to church had a house fire. And I think he has a GoFundMe page. What's the title of that GoFundMe page? Um, it's uh, I, ha I haven't sent it to you, didn't I? Okay, he's gonna. I think I think I he did, sent it to me. I did send it to you. Let me check. Uh, I'll go ahead and let y'all know at the church if you would like to help out uh, with the GoFundMe page, and I'll try to put it in the caption. So we're gonna pray for Sean. We're gonna pray for this church. Pray for the service. God, we ask that you move in a special way. We ask that you touch the people. Lord, I have come to hear the word of the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. So I'll be talking about one of the mis most misunderstood scriptures in the Bible. And uh, what came to my basis of talking about this scripture is when you meet a, when you meet people, they have a misconception that, you know, this one scripture uh, gives them the opportunity. They really don't need to be in church. They can just do God and do church and do everything their own way and really don't need the body or corporate believers together. We'll get right into our scripture. We're going to Matthew 18 and 20. Matthew 18 and 20. How many of y'all got the Bible, your Bible today? Uh-oh. Even if you got it on your phone, you can count it. All right. So we slacking. You got to have your Bible. You're coming to Bible study. We're going to have a Bible study. We're going to use the Bible. Just imagine you going to school, you don't even have your textbook. You're going to get an F. you got to bring your Bible. Open that Bible up. Don't get too late. Don't get too comfortable uh, because we put the scripture on the screen. Don't get too comfortable with that. All right. Matthew 18 and 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. What is that talking about? When you think about today's society, uh, a lot of times when I'm talking to people or talking to them about church or God, oh, there's two or three of us, we got church, we don't need nobody else, we got God, we got church, there's two of us, three together. A lot of people, have you ever heard that? someone say that statement? A lot of people have said that, and they feel just because they have that, they don't need no church, they don't need nothing, just us two, three get together, we're having church. But, is that really true? So we're going to go to Matthew 18, and we're going to talk a little bit about the scripture. Uh, we're going to understand and break the scripture down. What is he really talking about? Matthew 18 and 20. We talked about there. And the caption really is about sin and forgiveness. Sin and forgiveness. And we're going to go to Matthew 18 and 15. And what does it talk about? So sometimes when you're studying the Word of God, you got to look at what we call the Scripture context. What are they talking about? What is the plug? What is the subject? What is the, everything that's going on with the Scripture? That's what you need to look at. What we call Scripture context. Uh, we're going to Matthew 18 and 15. All well, right, give me a chance to turn there. Matthew 18 and 15. Good to see everybody in the house of God today. I miss y'all smiling faces. All right, we're up there. Matthew 18 and 15. Sins and forgiveness, that's the subtitle. And it's talking about, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he should hear thee, Thou hast gained thy brother. So we got to understand that this is given a concept of how to deal with relationships and how to deal with people. So a lot of times when we have an issue, when we have an issue with somebody or we're talking about somebody or we're having a problem, we don't go to that person alone. We need to go to that person and talk to them directly about the situation or the issue we have. So if I have an issue with Sean... 
I was going to Sean alone. Sean, I got a problem with you. I should go to nobody else. I hope you're looking up scripture, Sean, right? I texted you the link. Okay, good, good, good. You got me the link. Good, good stuff. We got the uh, GoFundMe page. Uh, Sean had a house burning, so we want to make sure if there's anything you give, he gave me the link. I'll give that at the church. Uh, GoFundMe. You just put that code. You yep. just put the code. Anybody that wants the link, I'll send it. It's a GoFundMe 705 E C eight E. And Lord willing the church will help out a little bit on that part, help them out. And we'll go to verse 16. And uh, so we hit that scripture. I think this is a good scripture. Let me hit that again. Matthew 18 and 15. It says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And he shall hear thee, thou hast gained a brother. So the issue we have a lot of times is someone talks about you and they go behind your back and then you go tell somebody else about it instead of talking to that person about the issue. Do you know that sometimes you might think someone said something about you but they didn't really say that? Or it might got misconstrued or uh, delivered wrong? You know, it was a, a story that where there was a couple from my own church and their son had did some stuff st stupid and they thought that I told them their son. So for 10, 15 years, they had something in their heart against me, thinking that I messed, I, I did something deliberate against their family. But what they had to do, all they had to do was ask me. And that's why the Bible says, go to that person, and you work out your situation. You know, uh, sometimes we waste a lot of time talking to people that can't help our problems. And then we waste time telling people about problems that don't really care about us. And then we got to be careful who you share your intimate secrets with, because sometimes they turn on you. And they're not your friends no more. And they use that against you. So we got to be careful. We go to one another alone and make sure that we get that worked out. Verse 16. It says, But if he would not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So if i got a problem with Kelly, I go talk to Kelly about it. And if she don't receive me, I go grab somebody. You know, I'll grab her husband, Sean. Then me and Sean are going to talk to her about it. Then if we can't get through her head, then we're going to grab Olivia. We're going to go talk to her again. <laughs> By the third time, we probably got enough backing that she gets a temper. We're going to pull the hammer. You know, but it's giving us that understanding that, hey, we need to have some witnesses. We need to talk to each other. We need to try to work out our situation. And then verse 17, and if he neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So what is it saying? I went to her. I tried to work out my situation. She didn't receive me. I got a witness. We went to her and tried to work it out. She didn't want to receive us. We went and got a third person. We tried to go work it out. She was just so stubborn. We went and took her before the church. And she didn't still want to receive us. Then we understand that there's no hope for that person. We all got to go pray for her and fast for her. <laughs> I'm saying I gotta, I'm earning my biscuits. I gotta cut her grass since I'm earning my biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what is that establishing a fact? How we work things out. And sometimes, you know, you look at it, for example, sometimes when a man is in the ministry or leadership, they can abuse their power easily. I remember there was a situation where a girl got into it with the pastor of a certain church between the East Coast and the West Coast, North and South Pole. And she did not have any representation. It's basically what the pastor said, this is what I want. And if you don't like it, you're just going to hit the door. Now, if we did it the way the scripture said, they would have had a chance to work it out. And they would have bought it before the church. And the church would have could have judged the matter. And then it also says in the Bible, if you judge something, you're supposed to bring the people that are at least 16. They don't have nothing to lose in the church to judge situations and matters. That that person doesn't feel like, man, I got... I got misrepresented. What? No one heard what I had to say. What about my feelings? How, how about the situation? How about how I felt about that situation? And so that's why we have to be careful with judgment. I might. I got to make sure that as being a pastor, that I don't have personal vendettas against people. You know, I can't say, well, just because I don't like this about something, I don't like that. That this is not personal. This is not my church. This is what we call the Lord's inheritance. So, for example. Uh, uh, sometimes what happens, a lot of churches, I think me and uh, Brandon was talking about this. So, Sean, how it usually works, a pastor has a church. 
And the, best, the next thing he would like to do is turn over to his son. Why? They want to keep it in the family. Right. Keep it the family business. You know, it would be a blessing if I could turn the church over to Josiah. But it's not my church to turn over. It's not my inheritance. Unless he's called of God or God has ordained him to take over, he's out of his position. He's out of the will of God. And there are so many churches where the pastors have they literally turned their churches over to their kids because they want to keep it in the family business. And the churches have turned the belly side up and have been destroyed. There was a man that he turned his church over to his son because he wanted to keep it in the family business. Instead of praying and seeking God to find out what was the mind of God, who did God want for that church? And then when his son took over the church, he ran it right down the drain. And then he gets on his knees, and he's crying, God, no, the church is messed up, but you know, it's not working out. He should have been crying and seeking God before he turned it over to his son. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So this is not our inheritance. This is the Lord's inheritance. We have to do it God's way. God has a man for every situation. God has a man for every season. And in verse 19, we have Matthew 18 and 19. And it says, again, I say unto you, that if two of you should agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask it, and it shall be done for them in my Father, which is in heaven. So is he talking about, hey, we're trying to work this thing out. So we're giving an example about forgiveness. If I have an issue with somebody, my job is to go to them first. I don't go to somebody else about it. I don't go to the person down the street. I go to them about the situation. Because sometimes we can have a misconception. You know, I can think, well, Bobby called me ugly. And I can be mad about it. But if I go to Papa, he didn't say, he didn't let me know. She didn't say, you're ugly. She said, you're really ugly. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was getting all bent out about that first term. Oh you, know, you know, but if I really go to her, and you know, Joe's name ain't really well, man. <laughs> You know, I was, I was talking about that little dog I saw going across the street. That dog was really ugly. I was really talking about you. You know, but we can have a misconception. We can think somebody said something about us. Especially when you hear somebody whisper. They're talking about me. They're talking about me. They're talking about me. They're, I know, I know they're talking about me. When I look that way, you turn the other way. That's the devil talking. Yeah, that can be the devil talking to you. Thinking that they're talking about you. They're not really. They probably had something, some airwax they're trying to get out of the air. You never know. And this is the verse 20. We're talking about one of the mis most misunderstood scriptures. Matthew 18 and 20. It says, For where there are two or three that are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So the context of the scripture we're talking about, sin and forgiveness. You know, we got to understand that some people are not going the right way. Some people are misdirected. We got the pleasure of watching a guy going down the wrong side of the street. I said, where are the cops when you need them? The guy was going on the wrong side of the street. People were getting out of his way. He is misdirected. He don't know where he's going. And why are we going to follow that person? So some people have a misconception when it's just two or three of us. We can have church. There are some people you don't need to follow. Because what did Jesus say? He said, if the blind follow the blind, they go what? They fall in that ditch. And what does that word blind mean? It's not a physical blind, but it's a spiritual blindness. And what does that spiritual blindness mean? that they do not correctly understand the word of God and they are leading you into falsehood and deception. And if you, you know, God holds us accountable. You know, when you go to school and you get that F, who does the teacher hold accountable? You. You. Well, you can say, well, you know, my neighbor, you know, my neighbor, uh, my neighbor kept picking on me. They hit on me. They did this. They did that. My parents didn't let me get to sleep on time. The teacher's holding you accountable. Same thing with the word of God. The Bible says what? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. you got to take living for God serious. We don't take living for God serious like we should. I take living for God serious because you don't know the day or the hour when God's coming back. Lord willing, if the Lord don't change my mind, I'll be preaching about Sunday. The thief has already come, and, you have, and you're still not ready. If the Lord don't change my mind, the thief has already come, and you're still not ready. And so people have a misunderstanding, a misunderstanding about that. I was I had to take care of some issue, and uh, I had to go meet with somebody, which a lot of people that are in the drug game know had to meet with them because they had to get somebody out of jail and all kind of stuff like that. This person's very well known in this city. And me and her, I had to preach to her on the porch. I'm not going to say her name, but a lot of people know she's one of the biggest in the city. 
But I had a preacher under church, and that's what kind of gave me this thought. And I was like, God, I don't have the message yet for Bible study. And next thing I know, I pop up preaching to her on her porch. Oh, and the people, some of the customers didn't like it. They saw me. They got nervous all of a sudden. Some of the customers walked up, and they're like, uh-oh, who's this that's a preacher up here? They don't mean who I am. They were just nervous. Why is he over here? Why is he on the front porch? We don't. Should we even say anything, or should we go back in our car? <laughs> <laughs> no, kind of, why are you nervous around the preacher? If you're doing well, you shouldn't be nervous. Hmm. But anyway, <laughs> so the person said, the lady said, you know what? Uh, I, I want to be right with God. I want to go to heaven. And you know, man, you just open a door to preach. I said, well, you got to start coming to church. And guess what she called it? Matthew 18 and 20. For when there are two or three gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So she felt comfort of that one scripture saying, you know what? I'm in God's presence. I'm in God's church. I don't need no church. I don't need no preacher. I don't need nothing else. That's a misunderstanding of the scripture. Because what is it talking about? It's talking about sin and forgiveness. You have one person. You got one person. I'll go to Kelly. It didn't work out. I'll go get another person. It didn't work out. I'll go get a third person. And it worked out. And after that, we got the church. What is the church? The body of Christ. And he said, if you don't receive after the church, that means God's stepping in there trying to help the situation. God's in the best of two or three people when it comes to forgiveness. Be able to forgive. You know, when we talk about uh, me and Sean, your husband Kelly, we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And there is some confusion. How many you know the Bible said, talks about there is the gift of the Holy Ghost? Gift is singular. Okay, that's where people get confused. Now there's gifts of the Spirit. Okay? How many people you know that don't have the Holy Ghost that have love? Raise your hand if you know somebody can love, that can be a loving person. They don't claim the Holy Ghost. My mom loved me for a year. She don't have the Holy Ghost. She's a loving person. What's one of the gifts of the Spirit? Ain't it love? So you see how people get confused? Gifts of the Spirit. And there's the gift of the Holy Ghost. When you get the gift of the Holy Ghost, you get it with the evidence of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. How can we prove that? The first time the Holy Ghost was given out was in Acts. And it says in Acts 2 and 1, they were all, 4 and 1, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. That's how they first got it in the Bible. So we can, we can prove if you didn't get it speaking in tongues, you didn't get it the way the Bible got it. So I don't know any way you got it. I want to get it the way the Bible had. Why? Because this is our teacher. This is our direction. Where people get confused is the gifts of the Spirit. Not everybody has all the gifts of the Spirit. For example, one of the gifts of the Spirit, we talk about the gift of knowledge. You'll find out sometimes I'll be preaching and a thought will come to my mind. I'll hear and mentally in my mind what someone is thinking. And then I will respond to it. I heard what you said. And I will respond with their, what they were thinking in their mind. That's a gift of the knowledge. That's one of the gifts of the spirit that God uses to reach and work and then draw, bring his people to him. So does everybody understand the difference between the gifts of the gift of the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the spirit? Now, there's diverse tongues. When we talk about diverse tongues, I've, I've only seen it once uh, where someone's sung in tongues. I was at a church and a person sung in tongues. It was one of the most beautiful sounds I've ever heard in my life. It was amazing. I only heard it like one time in my whole life, someone singing in tongues. Now, there's a such thing as tongues of interpretation. That's for the edification of the body. At this time, I don't have that gift where a person speaks in tongues and then God reveals to me what was said through the tongues. That's the gift of tongues of interpretation. Not everybody has that gift. That's one of the gifts of the Spirit, which is plural. Does that make sense? So she was confident saying, you know what? I'm in the midst of God. So I don't need church. I don't need God's way. But we got to understand we got to have a balance. We have to have a balance with the Scripture. We cannot take one Scripture and overmit everything else that God says. Why? Because God is bound to his word. And people have, over the years, used this as an excuse not to go to church or participate in church gatherings. 
We want to talk to you about Deuteronomy 12 and 11. Deuteronomy 12 and 11. Now, a question I have to ask you. In the Old Testament, were the children of Israel able to put the tabernacle anywhere they wanted? Does anybody know that? How can I prove it? You got the scripture to prove it? It's Deuteronomy 12 and 11. So the difference thing about this church is when we make comments or statements, we can back it up with the scripture. And that's very important. What you believe, you got to be able to back it up. I was talking to a guy yesterday, and he was talking about different things. And I wanted to be nice, but he was quoting things that were not in the scripture, that weren't backed up by the Bible. So I didn't want to have a confrontation with him. So I just let him talk, and I just, you know, okay, okay. Well, I've never seen that in there. I've never heard that. I know it wasn't in there because I read the Bible seven times, and the scriptures were not in there. One comment he made that they made 12 passageways out of the Red Sea. You don't find that in the scripture. And it made one way. God opened the sea and it went through, the, went through on dry ground. You know, and there's another conception that the blacks are the original Hebrews. I don't find that in the Bible. God don't really care what color you are. There are black Hebrewites, but they mixed them. When they came out of Egypt, they came a mixed multitude. Egypt was Africa, so they had mixed multitude. They mixed in. So you have that. So God's not all hanged up on what color your skin on skin is. Because, for example, the Bible says, what's the difference between a Jew and Greek? God don't really care about what color your skin is. We care. Some people care. I don't care. People care about what color people's skin is. I remember back when I was a young kid in middle school, and I had a white girlfriend. So I went home to my grandpa. I said, Grandpa, I said, you got a problem with me being with a white girl? He said, I ain't got a problem with it. I just want to hear what he got to say. I didn't care either if he didn't like it. Because why? I was my own man. And I'm going to do what I felt I wanted to do. And I wasn't going to let anybody dictate who I love because of the color of their skin. Or cared about at the time. I only love my sweet thing. Deuteronomy 12 11. And it says, Then shall there be a place which the Lord your God should choose to cause his name to dwell. There. Thither you shall bring in all that I command you. Your burnt offerings. And your sacrifices, your tithes, and your heave offering of your hand, and all the choice vows which to vow unto the Lord. This is what the law said through Moses. He said, hey, I'm going to choose a place where my spirit's going to do it. He had told them how they did it in the Old Testament. They had a pillar at night. They had a pillar of fire. And during the day, they had a pillar of cloud. And when that cloud was set, they understood, set the tabernacle up. This is where we're going to have sacrifices. This is where we're going to worship God. But when that started to leave, they understood it was time to pack up and keep going. And they would follow that to rest it and set. And that's how God took the people of Israel and had them travel through. Now, what did the psalmist say it's like? The psalm is, uh, Psalms 127 and 1. we got to understand this is a very important concept when it comes to the house of God or the building of the church of God. We are the church. We are his body. How do we become part of his body? We get born into the body. So, for example, we think about the King of England, you know, Prince Charles and all them born into wealth and majesty and money, plenty of money. How do you get in that family? You have to be born into it or you get married into it, okay? Same thing with the Bride of Christ. How do you get born into the Body of Christ? You get born into it. How do you get born into it? You get born again of the water and the Spirit. God adopts you. How do he adopt you? You have to take on his name. So when you get adopted, what happens? The father takes your name. You take the father's last name. So what's the name of the father? It is Jesus. Amen. John 5, 43, Jesus said, I come in my father's name. So when you get baptized in Jesus' name, you take on the name of your father in baptism. And now you are a part of the body of Christ once you receive the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues as the spirit gives the utterance. Psalms 127 and 1. A song or degree of Solomon, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. What is it saying to us? It's saying, except the Lord build that house, everything you're doing is in vain. You know, as we ride to church Sunday morning, we see people going to certain churches. And the question here is, Solomon said, unless the Lord build that house, they're going in vain. They're being faithful in vain. They're doing a religious... Services in vain. Except they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, 
the watchman waketh but in vain. Do you know that there's some cities that do not even have a real preacher, apostolic witness in their city? Their churches, there's no man of God standing against sin in their cities. Now you can go throughout, you can go throughout America and find there are cities with no churches that preach the truth. They don't preach there's one God. They don't preach repentance of your sins, baptism in Jesus' name. Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. You can go throughout plenty of cities and they don't even have an apostolic witness. And what does the Bible say in the Old Testament? It's not going to be a famine of food, but it's going to be a famine of the word. And that's so true in our day. You can find it. If you don't believe it, when you travel around, you barely find churches where a man of God is sticking up for the truth without fear or favor. That's not giving in to the peer pressure. That's not giving into the world and still standing for God. God has never intended for you to have a misconception, for you to work out your own salvation without his help. God wants us to be saved. What does the Bible say about us? He says that he's not willing that any should perish. It is not God's perfect design for anybody in this church to be lost. It's not God's design for anybody in the world to be lost. God doesn't want nobody to be without him. It is his perfect plan for you to be saved. It is his perfect plan that you can walk with him, that you can have a strong relationship with him, that you may know him in the power of the Holy Ghost. But by our own deceitfulness of our heart and our mind, we deceive ourselves. The sad thing is some people think they can live for God without God. You cannot live for God without God. You need God's help. I need God's help. How do we know? Some people say, well, you know, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. You know, sometimes when I'm debating people, when I'm talking to them about the word of God, they don't feel obligated to obey the word of God. They say, well, God knows my heart. God knows I'm a great, good, good person inside. But what does the Bible say about your heart? We're going to go to Jeremiah 17 and 9. What, amen, you own it, sister. What does the Bible say about our heart? And the Bible says, Jeremiah 17 and 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. 17 and 9, Jeremiah. And it's desperately wicked, and who can know it? Your heart will deceive you sometimes. That's why the Bible says, examine yourself. To see if you're being the faith. Prove yourself. Try yourself. Know yourself. You have to know, hey man, am I really living for God? Every, you and God know. You know, just like one time I was dealing with a guy named Matt. And I was like, Matt, you need to get straightened up. You need to live for God. He said, what am I doing, preacher? What sin am I doing? I said, I'm not here to play guessing games. You know. <laughs> you and God know what you're doing? They look stupid. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. You and God know. I ain't got to play guessing games with you, right? You and God know. And we got to understand that, there, you know, I talked one Bible study, that it's a battle for your mind. And the devil has you thinking, you can miss church and not be faithful to the house of God, you're going to be all right. Do you know I'm dealing with, I had to talk with Brandon, I'm dealing with a guy that we was working with, he said he's thinking about being an atheist now. He said, I'm thinking about being an atheist. Guess what? He had a problem being faithful to God. He had a problem being faithful to the house of God. His heart is deceiving him. He thought, you know, you know, he told me a lot of times, Olivia, he's like, I don't need to come here the same thing over and over again. I already know the scriptures. I already know what I can do. I said, well, you already know it. That's why you're living it. <laughs> <laughs> to him that knows to do good and do if not, to him is sin. And you know God so well in the Bible, so well, why you ain't living it? Why you don't need, you don't need to preach? You don't need this. You do need it. And that's a, what happened. He deceived himself. And that's so easy to see yourself. And that's why the devil strategically and mastermindedly pulls people out. Gets them not thinking the house of God is important. And he just started to get you thinking it's not important. And when you sit out a little bit, it comes second place. It's easy to miss another day. It's easy to miss, miss another day. And just like one of my friends, he started missing job, he started missing church for work. All of a sudden he said, you know, I guess I don't even need to come back no more. Because what did the devil do? Put that plan in him. That seed that you don't need God, you don't need church right now. And you can do it your way. And what's it that will pull you in and get you thinking you got it all worked out? 
If you're so smart, why are you not a millionaire? Come on now. You're so smart, you got it all figured out. Why you ain't got money oozing out everywhere? Why we can't go to you and get all kind of loans? You're that smart. And it says, who can know it? My heart, our heart, your heart can be wicked. It can get you thinking some stupid things, especially when you're young and you're single. You're thinking that girl like you, she ain't thinking two cents about you. She like me. She love me. And she won't even say hi to you. <laughs> Us ugly folks, we always had to go through that. Praise God. I tell people, the Lord bless me, give me a good looking wife. Libby, she only married me because she felt sorry for me. She said, nobody going to love that ugly little duckling. I'll go and love him. <laughs> Probably kiss that frog, you become handsome. It didn't work, baby. It didn't work. Verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. God loves you. He's going to see if you really want to live for God. I had a friend just got out of prison. I'm trying to work with the guy. Man, pastor, I'm ready to get baptized. I'm ready, man, I'm ready to bring people to church. I'm ready to help save a whole bunch of folks. I said, man, it's okay. Let's see what happens when you get out. Pastor, I'm ready to do it. I'm doing it. Do it. Do it. I'm going to get him. 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 Guess what happened? A little, a little pretty little girl started calling that phone. Pretty little girls. And you start forgetting, man, I'm supposed to be in church today. What happens? What God said, what did he say right here? He said, I, the Lord, search the heart and I try the reins. Me and Papa was talking about it back when I was single and my pockets did jingle. Uh, I worked at K-State, Kansas University. I was a custodial engineer. I was the one that got bubble gum off the floors and cleaned the, the toilets and everything like that. I just did all the dirty stuff. And I was happy. I walked around with a smile on my face. I'm sitting there living at one time scrubbing, scraping gum off the floor. And all the college students, engineers, and people getting their doctorates and PhD looking at me. That's why I'm going to school. So I ain't going to be like that guy scraping gum off the floor. And I'm just scraping the gum off the floor, being happy. Make my little $9.21 an hour. <laughs> Hallelujah. I was a happy little guy. Came there and cut some grass. I, I made it. I took the best out of what I had. And then one day, uh, a real beautiful, beautiful Spanish lady. Say, you know, Joseph, I, I got some stuff to do it after school, and I need you to take me home to my apartment at night. And I said, like, you know what? I lived in Jonesy City. I was like, whoa. I felt like Will Robson, danger, danger, Will Robson, danger, danger. I was like, you know what? I went all the way to Jonesy City, grabbed me a bodyguard. I grabbed Papa. I said, Papa, I'm gonna have, I got this fine woman I got to pick up. Take her home. I want you to come with me because I'm not going to do nothing. I don't want something said or an accusation, or I don't want to fall into something stupid. So I went and picked up Papa. We went and picked her, took her home, and, you know, dropped her off. And flesh tried to pull me. And I was like, you know what? I got my bodyguard here. We're going to be saved today. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. That's why, and you know, when you date somebody, bring somebody with you. You know, because, you know, to be serious with you, when you date somebody nowadays, you don't know who you date. That's right. You might be dating a pervert. You might be dating a pedophile. You might be dating a person that's mentally challenged. That might be a little, you know, one cup loose of a fruit loop. <laughs> and you don't know it. And I, I sad to say a lot of there are a lot of men, there's no disrespect to you women, there are a lot of men a lot stronger than you. You know, someone asked me, Pastor, do you believe in chaperones? Yeah, I believe in chaperones. You know, what happened you go on a date with somebody and they said you raped them? How is your word against theirs? Or you know, you had a little your, your daughter, you, she's doing everything she's supposed to do right. She meets this nice guy at church. He takes her out, takes advantage, and rapes her. But if he had somebody there, she'd have been protected. We can't take them chances because we don't know people's intentions. They might seem good on the outside, but they might be a devil inside. You have to be careful. God forbid if I lost my wife and I started dating, I'll have me a chaperone. I wouldn't be going with a woman alone. Why? Because I can't trust my flesh. You can't either. I got a lot of it. I got to put it in control. My flesh is desperately wicked. It want to be wild. It want to do crazy things. And what I have to do? I have to tame the beast. How do I tame the beast? I got to pray every day. I got to get my mind. I got to get that mind of Christ back in my mind. Because what happens? That worldly mind tries to take over me. And that's the only way you're going to be saved. Search the reins. To, even to give every man a 
according to his ways. We got to understand, you know, everybody knows the law of the harvest. Everybody, anybody know what the law of the harvest is? Whatever you reap, that will you sow. So if you go to, you have a little farm and you put some corn in it, Brandon, you don't expect no apple tree to come up, right? No. <laughs> Brandon probably think, man, why the apple tree to come up? I know I put the apple tree here. <laughs> we love Brandon. He's been working with me. We can be difficult. I can be difficult to work with sometimes. Can I, Brandon? We both can. We both can. Hey, Amen. We both can. And uh, with the law of the harvest. So you got to understand, if you're not sowing good things, you're not sowing a prayer life, you're not sowing fasting, you're not sowing a strong dedication to God, it's going to come up in front of everybody. Because the Bible lets us know what we do in secret will be manifested in front of everybody. So you got if you want to reap good things, you got to start planting good things. You need to start planting good thoughts. You need to start thinking positive about yourself. Philippians 4.13 says what? I can do all things through Christ that strengthen me. You got to understand God loves you. The Bible says you're the head and not the tail. You're supposed to be above and not beneath. You got to stop thinking so lowly of yourself. You got to stop thinking that I'm trash, I'm this, nobody loves me, and I don't have this, I don't have that. You know, you can write on the paper all the good things you have. You got good health. You got to, you know, sometimes we get misconception. You know, we don't have the money like, you know, I don't have the body like the rock guy. You know, I ain't got the body like the rock. You know, I ain't got the house like the rock. I ain't got the money and the nice cars and all that. But you know, you know how, 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 uh, how I say that word? I just studied my vocabulary, trying to get more intelligent. But you realize you have everything rich people have. Guess what? They have an air conditioner. They get to have a warm house in the winter. They get to have a cool house in the summer. How many of us got heat and air conditioning? And we got food. We got plenty of food. I'm talking about sometimes we have to get rid of it. Yes. So even the rich people, they got food. And we got a car. I'm a simple guy. I'm a hoopty guy. You know, everyone's like, man, Pastor, why you don't have a real nice car? My car works. I got my truck. I got a hoopty truck. <laughs> it got rust in it and everything. I'm just tugging along the road. I said, hey, when it gets so bad, Libby, I'll be like the Flintstones. I'm going to start getting barefoot. We're going to start running down the road. <laughs> Footstar. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I don't have to have all the flashy stuff. Not on my, my wife. I because she deserve it. I wouldn't mind now having one of the big Mercedes with that big star, Bobby. I wouldn't mind having one of them. But I just don't want the payment. I'm going to say, that's, man, that's more fruit snacks for me and the kids. Be taken away. So, no. You know, and one day I might, you know, I might get rich and famous and be able to afford something like that. But right now, I just keep my hoopty. Now, let me ask you a question. If you're a real father, you love your children. How many is a father? How many you love your kids? Uh, uh, man, I love my, my little kids, my little schnooker wooker. Boy, she come give daddy a kiss. I'm going to play and wrestle with my son. I'm telling you, you know, they said the story, you don't really know how much you love until you start having kids. Oh, my goodness. You love them. Oh. And, you know, mom can be mad at you. You know, you've been stupid. You didn't do what you're supposed to do. But the kids see you. Daddy, daddy, daddy. Ah! It's happy to see you no matter what. Oh, man, that's such a blessing. But the Bible tells us who our father is. Who is our father? Malachi 2 and 10. Who is our father? Amen. Malachi 2 and 10. What does it say? And then after church, we have some quick announcements we're going to do. Malachi 2 and 10. Most, most, most understood scripture. Malachi 2 and 10 says, Have we not all one father? How many fathers we got? One. Have not one God created us? So is there a trinity? No. There's only one, one, like you always say, one, 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 one way to God. One, 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 one way to God. One, 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 one way to God. Baptize in Jesus' name. One God. And then I, I feel like to hit the scripture. <laughs> one God created us. Why do we deal so treacherously, every man against his brother, by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Uh, baby, I want you to pull up that scripture of the Trinity. 
of the three pictures of the three people in the Trinity. Now, this is one scripture that I went over last time, or a, a documentation or something. And there was one thing that God dealt with me later that I did not show regarding the scripture. And as she pulls that picture up, I'm going to give you some scripture to prove that the Trinity is not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Praise. I'm going to get that up for us in a moment. I love the word of God. It saved my soul. It changed me. Mm. Find it today. It should be Trinity Picture. going to pull it up. And uh, when I start teaching people about the Trinity, Trinitarian doctrine, a lot of people have never even seen this picture. They, for example, what the Trinity teaches that there's three persons in heaven. They're co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal. So you have an older person, which is God the Father, represents God. You have a second person, which is a younger man that represents Jesus, what they say. And then you have a third person they call the dove. Either they're confused or they're silly. I don't want to go hunt where someone that thinks a dove is a person. So they call them that third person a dove. When they call it a bird or a dove, you don't know the difference. Please do not take me hunting. You might end up getting shot. So this is the representation of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, which is the third person. And let's see if this is true. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. What does Isaiah 45 and 5 say? Mom, baby, don't take the picture off. I'll quote the scripture. Isaiah 45 and 5. Give everyone a chance to turn there. We're going to see, is this true? Most of Christianity, over 95% of people that go to churches today, believe in the Trinitarian doctrine. How much? Probably about, I don't know, have the exact number. Like about 95%. Every, most every church you go to actually believes. Uh, even in Jackson City, there's probably two or three churches that don't believe this doctrine. That I know of personally right now. Two for sure. I don't know how many more know. Probably three. What number? Uh, Isaiah 45 and 5. How many have ever seen this beside coming to church about this Trinitarian picture? Have you ever seen that before? No. Yes. Like that? Disciple. Yep. No, that's the supper. That's different. Isaiah 45 and 5. You ready? All right, let's read it. Let's see if this is true. It says, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I gird at thee, though thou hast not known me. So what does the scripture say in Isaiah? He's saying, there is no God beside me. So is that true, or is that a lie? That's true. That picture's true? Yes. You think it's true? He's talking about different religions. Okay, where, where are you this, finding that? This picture doesn't say God is not, like, you see how it says God is not, the Father is not the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy uh -huh. Spirit is not the Son. That's not speaking of, like, it, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit being its own God. Him saying there's no other God before me or beside me, he's talking about different religions, like, I don't know, like, I don't know the other guys, the, the Hinduism and Judaism and all that. Like, that's not talking about, like, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. So you, so you believe that picture is correct? Yes. Okay. So let's talk, well, you know, it's okay. It's no problem. So we're going to actually talk about it. So... First of all, so you say you feel that God is a man. You still feel God is a man. If God is one God, and there's three in one. We'll okay. You feel God's... But I'm, asking, I'm asking you. Then I'm not challenging them. I'm just talking to you. Do you feel God is a physical man? No. He's a creator. He's a creator. I don't think he's... Like, I've never... You can't say he's walked on the earth. Like, Jesus walked on earth. Right. The Holy Spirit didn't walk on earth. Jesus did. Right. So God... I mean, Jesus was a physical man. God is the creator of the universe. The Holy Spirit is... So we agree that God's not a physical man. I don't know. Okay. I'm just saying. Well, no, no, no. My knowledge. No, no, no. Okay. 
No, it's, it's okay. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad or put you on the spot. I just want to understand where you're coming from because you got to understand when we teach this, this is online, the other people probably have the same questions. Right. So it's okay. I want people to be able to understand it because some people might not understand. So I'm not trying to challenge you and make you look bad or anything. I just want to understand where you're coming from so I can actually explain it. So it's all good. So, for example, you might feel that God is a man. So in the scripture, it teaches that God is not a man, neither the son of man that he can repent. And John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So God doesn't have any flesh or blood. So that was the purpose of Jesus Christ coming on the scene. For example... He said, thou hast made me a body. Now, Jesus is the Lamb of God. So in the, as far as the Trinitarian doctrine, they believe that Jesus Christ was in the beginning with God. No. You don't believe that? Okay. Well, some, I can't say, speak for all, but some Trinitarians have believed it. Which, which you got a question, Brandon, or a statement? Well, you know, saying it was planned before the foundation of the world, that means it was in the foreknowledge of God that God had that already planned out. Well, I'm saying I believe he's one, and I'm saying that's Jesus, God himself, as a man, God. being omnipresent, already had himself slain on the cross before he had the world created. Okay, well, you know, some people might believe that. So when it's talking about foreknowledge, so he didn't already have that done because it had to ha actually happen. So that, for example, it wasn't a foreknowledge of God. How can we say that? God knows the end from the beginning. That's why he wrote the revelations. The revelations is things that come to pass. And he wrote it before it happened, so that was prophecy. So in the foreknowledge of God, God being omniscient and omnipresent, he knows the end from the beginning. Yes, he was slain to the foundation of the world because he already knew that was going to happen. But scripturally... Huh? Yes. Exactly. But scripturally, it was not until the fullness of John, Galatians 4 and 4, maybe turn there. We're going to prove that Jesus did not come onto the scene until he was born. Galatians 4 and 4, what does it say? And this is a good point, you know, so some people, this is a good teaching because I like to open up so people can talk. Because this is some of the questions we haven't had a one-on-one -on -one to talk about. Let me hit this thought right here. Uh, Galatians 4 and 4, we'll give you a chance to turn there. And we're going to talk about, when did Jesus come on the scene? Galatians 4 and 4. It says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of the woman, made under the law. And what does it mean by made under the law? That every man, man child, had to come through the matrix of a woman. That's born under the law. So it wasn't until the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman. Now, why is he called the son of God? Because he was born of a woman. Now, was the flesh that Jesus Christ robed in, was that God? No. That was the flesh. Inside him was the spirit of Jehovah God. So, when we talk about as far as the Trinitarian doctrine, it says they're all co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal. And it says that they're three persons. God's not a man. He's not a person. He's a spirit. The only time he came unto existence as far as manifestations, when he manifested himself as something. For example, in the Old Testament, he manifests himself as a Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Then one time he manifested himself before Abraham. For example, give me a moment around with that. Uh, actually, uh, write, write what you're going to say down. You can bring it up if you don't mind. Write it down what you're going to say down. So I don't, I don't miss the train of my thought. So then one time when God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, it said that three men appeared before Abraham. And it says, and Abraham stood yet before the Lord, and the other two that left were the angels that went to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he started telling them, he said, well, I'm about to destroy the city. Shouldn't I talk to Abraham and tell him what I'm going to do? Because knowing that he's going to be a great man, and he's going to be a ruler of nations. He stood yet before the Lord. So there is a thing where God took on a manifestation, or took on a physical image of a person to represent himself to somebody. Right. And for example, Daniel, the fourth man in the fire, when they was going to get burnt, he was, they said, we see the Son of Man sitting there. That was not Jesus Christ, but that was a manifestation 
of God. Then how do we prove that God was manifest in the flesh? Uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. It proves that actually God was put in human form. Uh, the Lord, Daniel one, by the fire? No, not that one, the Salem and Gomorrah. Uh, Genesis 18 and 1. Genesis 18 and 1. Actually, we got you turned here. Uh, you're going to hit that, hit that uh, God was manifest in the flesh real quick. We in Bible class today, praise God. What was your question while we're taking a break, friend? Yeah, it was a glorified body. It was but like the rest of the appearance of himself. Yes. So that's how you know it's one because it's like he didn't change at all when he went up. Yeah. Because they recognized him and they said, Oh, that's the one who was with us. Yeah. So they recognized him and they said, Oh, this is Jesus who we've been all things. Amen. Come on, man. This up, you know? Good stuff. So Timothy uh two sixteen, and it says, Without controversy. That means without an argument. It says, Great is the mystery of godliness. It's a mystery to some people. When we look at the pictures of the Trinity and we go over different doctrines, it's a controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels. It's a God did that. He came in human form as Jesus Christ. Now, why did God come in human form as Jesus Christ? To redeem humanity and become what? The ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Because before Jesus came on the scene, we would have to sacrifice the blood of bulls and goats. The high priest would take that blood every year, go to the go to the tabernacle, put that blood at the mercy seat, and our sins would get pushed one year ahead. Every year, the high priest did that once a year. Now, Jesus Christ becoming our high priest, we don't have to have the bloods of bulls and goats no more. Why? Because he shed his blood on the cross. So how do we get the blood applied to our and our blood to our life? We take on his name. And water baptism. That's why we get baptized in Jesus' name. That's when the blood is applied to our life. And every sin you ever commit, every evil deed, doesn't matter what it was under the sun, it gets all washed away in Jesus' name. Genesis 18 and 1. And we're going to go to 18 and 1, and we're going to talk about, I made a comment that Abraham appeared before the Lord, and the other two were angels. And we're going to prove that and if you study the Trinitarian doctrine, they tell you this is the first time that the Trinity was ever mentioned in the Bible, where three men came. And they said that's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And let's see if that's right. Genesis 18 and 1. It talks about the subject of the matter is three visitors. Genesis 18 and 1. I love talking about this word. All right, you're ready to turn 18 and 1. And it says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of memory, and he sat in the door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch you a bristle of bread and comfort ye in your hearts. After you shall pass on, and therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, So do as you have said. And Abraham hastened unto, hastened unto Sarah and said, Make ready, quick, three measures of fine meal, and knead it, and make cakes upon the earth. And Abraham ran into the herd and fetched a calf tender of good. And gave it to the young man he had dressed it. And we can kind of skip a little bit over there because it talks about, let me hit that. It just talks about them feeding them. Okay, and we're going to skip all the way down to verse 14. No, let's go to verse 16. 18 and 16, kind of skip some of that food stuff. They're about to eat. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham 
that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham should surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth should be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his house hold after him, that they should keep the ways of the Lord and do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham all that which he has spoken. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And it says, And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. He stood right before God and started talking to him. Now, I'm going to prove to you that the other two men were not the part of the Trinity, that they were two angels. How can I prove that? I go to 19 and 1. What is 19 and 1? Genesis 19 and 1. I'm going to prove the other two guys were angels. And there came two angels to Sodom, even as Lot said in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. So Abraham stood yet before the Lord. The other two looked toward faces toward Sodom and Gomorrah. And we find in 1901, the two that came there were the two angels of the Lord. Yeah, but the, the Bible never said that the three men were the Holy Trinity. No, no. That's what Trinitarian history says. Oh, okay. Yeah, you never, you never find that. But you actually, when you study it, uh, I was actually, I do study of Trinitarian doctrine. And they actually said this is the first time that they actually can mention that the three representations of the Trinity there. Yeah, but how? That's someone's history. That's what they thought. That's what they said. They just assumed that? Yeah, that's what they assumed. But if you don't know the scripture, it sounds right. It sounds good. Right. So, but that's why we have to, word upon word, line upon line, precept upon precept, you have to rightly divide the word of God. Okay. Any other questions about that? You got a question about it? Anybody you got a question or a statement? Well, uh, I'll take it. Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Any other questions? We clear on that? Okay. Cool. All right. Now we talks about uh, we're gonna go to Malachi four and six. What is the role of the father to instruct his children in the ways of God? The ministry job is to bring you back to God. That's our job, is to bring you back to God. We all stray, we all get off focus, we all get our mind in the gutter. And what is the purpose of the ministry? What is the purpose of church? Is to get us refocused back on God, back on His will, back on His way. You know, you find that you find that undercover, the undercurrent pull, the pull you away from God all the time. Well, you know, it's time for church. Well, you know, I got something else to do. I can go shopping. I can do the holy roll, get me some sleep. I can do this. I can do that. All your friends are calling you. Hey, let's go here. Let's do that. Let's hang out. And what is the devil trying to do? Keep you out of the house of God. Why? So he can talk to you. So he can start working on you. So he can start manipulating you. He can start deceiving you. You look at the animal kingdom. We look at God. How we know God is real? Archaeology proves God is real. If we look at the galaxy, it proves that God is real. All the galaxies all in the world, Saturn, Neptune, all the places, and everything's in perfect order and structure. Nothing's running into each other unless we get an asteroid trying to tear us up. You know, we got the sun. We got the earth rotates perfectly around the sun. It doesn't bump into each other. God has everything in our, in our, rotate in the atlas that we get night time. We get sun time. God has it all perfect. Every animal is born with an instinct of survival right when it's born. No one has to teach an ant what to do. No one has to teach a lion what to do. He know, go get that meat to eat. No one has to teach them anything. They're born with a natural instinct. Why? Because there is an awesome, intelligent design by God. That put it in them to be able to do what they need to do. The only thing that doesn't do what it's supposed to do is man, us. Why? Because we want to do it our way. We got it all figured out. We got it all planned out. But when our plans fail, we realize that we need God. And we need God more than we think. Malachi 4 and 6. Malachi? Yep, Malachi 4 and 6. And anytime you got a question, feel free. I, I love questions. You know, we've got, it was one time, Bobby, we had a preacher, and our old pastor used to open up for questions. And he knew that Bible, so he wasn't intimidated by any question. And we had, was going to get a new preacher. It was like, man, are you going to do that to He said, oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to be asking no questions in front of everybody. You know, put me on the spot. 
I was like, man, I like that. I like questions, don't bother me. <laughs> and one time someone asked my wife about something, she said, you know, my husband don't answer to that. If I don't know it, I'll find it. Praise God. Malachi 4 and 6. And you shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with the curse. What is the role of the men in our life, or the men of God in our life? Is to bring our hearts back to God. To bring our desires, our emotions, back to our Creator. You know, you look at your life, I'm, 40, I'm 42 years old right now. The average lifespan of a person is almost 70 years old. If you get over 70, you burn some grace. You know, you meet somebody, you know, we, we have some customers right now that I cut grass for. You know, Mr. Perry. And he's like, I think 70-something, he has a hard time even getting around. You know, God, you don't know how much more time he has. You know, he got some real bad health and everything. Like, keep him in your prayers. You know, let's say you got 70 good years. Don't waste it. Don't waste it on frivolous living and things that do not benefit you. The Bible says, serve God in your youth while you got strength. Excuse me. I want to give you a shout. While well, you got strength and vigor, get it to God. Don't wait till you. It's not against being old and not being able to move around. You know, it's not wrong with that. But give God your best years. Don't give the devil all your years. And then when you basically washed up and can't do anything, you want to come serve God. Hey God, here I am. Use me. Let God use you while you got some strength. While you got a little spunk left in you, right, Bobby? Right. <laughs> Hosea 4 and 6. Why is our world in such a bad condition, Kelly? People don't believe in the Lord. Yep, but the scripture almost talked about it. You know, believe. And also, I was going to hit the other concept, Hosea 4 and 6. Why is our world so messed up? You know, if we could just, everyone, if we could turn back to the Bible, turn back to God, our world could change in a matter of days. If everyone would repent and start living for God, this whole world would be beautiful like God intended it to be. Hosea 4 and 6, and what gives some people a chance to turn there? I'm almost about to wrap this up. <clears throat> That's why I talk about digging your teeth in the Word of God. This is how you get it. You start getting that Word of God, you start applying it. Don't just take the Word, you take it home and you apply it. You write scriptures down. You start to learn it. You soak up in this Word of God. Hosea 4 and 6. And what does it say? It says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's why my people are messed up. That's why my people are addicted. That's why my people are bound. Why? Because of lack of knowledge. God has something better for everything. Amen. God has the best plan for you. He has it all figured out. He got somebody to love you. He got somebody who wants to be in your life. He got somebody who wants to help you. Amen. He wants to be a way maker when you don't seem like there is a way. Yep. Come on now. He wants to help you work out your situation. Yes, he does. But you have to trust in him. You have to have faith. Yep. And what does the Bible say? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Why? For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder to them that diligently they make effort. They take advantage of the time that diligently seek him. You got to take advantage of God. And how you take advantage of God? Spending time with him. Building a relationship with him. Talking to him. Falling in love with him. Being thankful for what you already have. Yes. You know, sometimes we get to God, we're like a Christmas list. God, I want this and that, I want this and that, I want this and that. God, like, man, I'm going to give you all this and that. Well, how much more do you need? Uh, right. We get, man, we start begging God. God, give me this. Give me, 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 because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. 
Do you know, I have been to a situation and people that know me closely, I have tried to help the most, the, some of the most ignorant folks you ever met in your life. Yes, you have. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> And Papa, my, I'm telling you, there's some people here so smart. I, sometimes I'm ignorant. Man, they just say they want to come to church. Woo! Hey, come on, let's do it. I'm going to do everything I can to help you get saved. But I'm telling you, some of these people, this scripture is making it so plain. My people are destroyed of lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee. Some people don't want help. Give me, give me, give me, give me. They don't want to help. All they got to do is repent, get the Holy Ghost, live for God, God, put their life together. But they want to be stuck at the dope house. And don't have, can't even pay their bills. Stuck with their abuser. Yep, stuck with their user. Can't even pay their own bills. And then they get mad at the preacher. Oh, man, that preacher thinks he's better than everybody. Man, I'm going to hold you accountable. That preacher didn't give me enough. Yeah. We don't do enough for you. You know, I tell Kelly, I'm good to go. I'm good to go as long as I give them everything they want. But when I hold somebody accountable, oh, he ain't right. His spirit ain't right. That preacher ain't right on that hill. He gonna make me do what I said I'm supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, these people. You didn't listen. Yep, I didn't listen. I like it, bit Papa. I like it a bit sometimes, but I'm starting, I'm starting, to, I'm starting to get a little common sense. I'm starting, I'm starting to come around a little. I'm getting tired of getting a bit. I got to start listening to that pretty little woman the Lord gave me. She got, that's why the women are smarter than us. Yeah, we got to listen to them. Yeah, we got to listen. That's where we met Sean. You got to listen to that woman. I, you know, we're we, we going to work up. <laughs> <laughs> not my other Sean. Not my, not my Deacon Sean. I'm talking about other Sean. What's your last name? Sautel. Sautel. We're talking about Sean Sautel. Sean be like, Pastor, what you talking about? I get a phone call at the ground. I'm going to talk about you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. And when God said, Thou should not be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of God, I shall also forget thy children. And what is he saying to the, he's giving a reference to the priest. Since you're not doing what you're supposed to do, you're not teaching my people, you're not helping them live for me and bring their hearts back to me, he said, I'm going to forget your children. And that's the last thing you want to do. I have seen it time and time again where I have seen generations of backsliders where their kids don't even know God. So far from God, the parents are far from God, the kids are far from God, don't even have no acknowledgement. And you'll be surprised that people that don't take God serious, they end up, going to, they, they end up seeking familiar spirits. I was at Dillon's not too long ago. I saw a warlock. I could say, I told Brandon, I said, that's a warlock. <laughs> <laughs> that's a male witch. But he could have, he, you could have seen it in his eye. That dude looked like a warlock, man. You can tell he can play with all the little demons. You know, hopefully I, someday he'll let me catch that devil out of him in Jesus' name. Praise God. God always has a God always has a choice for his people to be led by a godly man that follows after God. The Bible says in Romans 10 and 14, we're about to close, wrap this TV show up. Best thing on Facebook, the word of God. Amen. I started doing Facebook. My cousin was like, Joseph, do Facebook. I'm like, oh, what are you talking about? What, 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 what? Facebook? I didn't know what she was talking about. And next thing they hooked me up a little phone and put my Facebook on. I was like, oh, okay. And so I was doing Facebook before COVID happened. And so when COVID happened, man, we was already in the swing of things. God opened the door. I started church in May. COVID happened that next year in March. We was already doing Facebook and YouTube and all that. So I was already ready for it. Ten, excuse me, Romans 10 and 14. Boy, my allergies was kicking my butt today, Brandon. Man, I was snotting everywhere. I, and I was wondering why nobody wanted to share my grapes with me. <laughs> Romans 10 and 14. And we were talking about earlier the mis misunderstood scripture when people say, and the two or three are gathered and I'm in the midst of us. We just have us. We can have church. We can do it all without ourselves. That's one of the most misunderstood scriptures. And I want to let you understand that, hey, you need God. You need church. And you need a body of believers. You need encouragement. Hey, it's, it's good to see you back in church, June. It's good to see you back in action. We got to whip the devil together. 
I need you to elbow him once in a while. Give him an amen. That means you elbow the devil. <laughs> Romans 10 and 14. And what does it say? Oh, get my friend, my, my sister Chance to turn there. We, we're going to slow this horse down. Amen, amen. I'm excited what God's doing. That's all right. Take your time. Take your time. Romans 10 and 14. And then I'm going to go over to slow. That says, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? The next one's going to be uh, Hebrews 10 25, Kelly. Hebrews 10 and 20, excuse me. But Romans 10 14 says, how then should they call on him whom they have not believed? So faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You got to be put in that environment where we talk about God. We talk about his ways. We talk about his infinite knowledge, his infinite power. God has all power in heaven and earth. Anything you need, you start believing and praying, God's able to do it. If you're addicted, you're bound by anything, you start believing God. God, give me the power. Give me the strength. Give me the will. God's going to help you overcome that. Why? Because he's God all by himself, and you don't need nobody else. You've got to start believing God that you can overcome every circumstance the devil puts in your life. Yes. Without faith, it is impossible. God wants you to just believe him. God, I need your help. God, I can't do without you. God wants you leaning on him, yes. believing on him through every situation in your life. There is nothing too hard for God to pull you through. Amen. Right now, I'm going through multiple trials, multiple things going on in my life because, you know, being angry and being dead. But you know what? I'm leaning on God. God's going to deliver me out of every evil work that the enemy's trying to throw against me. Come on. And I felt God let me know he got my back. Yes. God's going to work it out. Yes. But I have to be faithful. I have to believe God. i got to keep my spirit and my heart right. I can't get bitter at God because my situation ain't the way I exactly want it. I can't get to say, God, I can't charge God foolishly. Well, God, why you let this situation happen to me? You know, I remember one time I was thinking, getting ignorant. I'm God's number one child. God woke me up real quick. I ended up getting fired, walked out the job. My boss let me know. And she fired me. And what happened was that I was uh, at Western Wireless, the cell phone place. I was tired that day. I don't know if I was cutting grass or whatever. And I was doing a call and I was listening. You know when you work at a call center and they have you listening to somebody? And I went to sleep on the phone. <laughs> and he reported me. Joseph went to sleep. I was like, oh, man. So they broke me up. And I was like, man, that devil reported me. <laughs> and I got, you know, little by little, little things happened. I got fired. And so I'm sitting in front of the boss. And we're sitting there and we're talking. And uh, she's like, Joseph, what you going to do then? And I said, I don't know. Lawn season, was, lawn season was over. She said, are you going to go pick up some leaves? <laughs> I said, probably not. But what she was trying to do, she was trying to fit me. But what the Bible said, perfect peace, that I love that law, and nothing shall offend thee. I wasn't going to let her get my spirit, get me down. Papa, you that day when Brian tried to come talk trash to me? <laughs> I was sitting there one day, and then dude came to my house, Bobby. I got fired from my job. I'm supposed to be depressed. I'm supposed to have my boo-hoo stick out. But thank me, I knew God was going to supply all my needs. Why? According to his riches and glory. Why? Because I've been faithful to God. I paid my tithes and my offering. And God said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. When they come try to devour, devour your finances, take advantage of you, I'm going to get your back. I made sure I did what I was supposed to do. So when I needed God, God stepped right in like he's going to do. So Brian came over there. We call him nickname Crazy Brian. He's like, man, you got fired? I said, yeah. He said, man, you serve God. Why you get fired? I thought you're supposed to be a Christian. I am a Christian. Why? You know, I made some mistakes. Well, you know, you're a Christian. Why are you getting fired? Why, why? Doesn't God love you? Why are you having this situation? Why things are not going the way it's supposed to go? And I'm sitting there like, hey, God's going to take care of me. God got my back. I'm going to get a job. I'm going to start working. I'm going to make a way. I'm going to get out there and fill applications. I'm going to do what I got to do because I will get a job. After my body, he's like, you know what? You encourage me to go get a job, too. <laughs> and guess what? The devil sent him, Brandon, to discourage me. To rub his feet all down my head. And make me feel like, what? God don't love me. But I knew God loved me. I'm telling you, I got one of them ugly faces only mama could love me. Talk about my wife. 
Amen, mama. I just got an ugly face. You just love me. You love me, don't you? No matter I'm ugly? I know, mama. Mama tried to make me feel good. Oh, thank you, mama. The pretty girls didn't tell me that at school, though. <laughs> <laughs> and you know you would have held for line, mama. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you know even, a, even a bum when he dressed up looked halfway decent. Yeah. I mean, you know, we'd be out there cutting grass. I'd be looking like a homeless person. And, you know, me and Papa, I'm 6'1", he's 6'3". So when we're not dressed nice, we look pretty intimidating. I remember we was at Sonic. What's up, bro? Remember Walmart? Yeah, you seen it. You seen it. He seen it. We was at Sonic, right, Bobby? And me and Papa was walking by a car. The lady started getting nervous. I rolled her the window up. <laughs> don't get me, please. Don't get me. Don't get me. Don't get me. Sometimes I walk in a Walmart, I look so dirty. There'd be a lady with a kid, he looked the other way. So hoping I would say hi to him. And I was at Dylan's doing something. The lady's like, I say, hey, I'm a pastor. She's like, you never looked to me like a church person. I read you. <laughs> but God is good no matter that situation. Hebrews 10, 25, we're about to wrap this up. And it says, by a new living way. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me hit this part. I think I didn't hit all that. How should they, oh, let's see, Romans 10, 14, let me read it again. How then should they hear on him, excuse me, how then should they call on him who they have not believed? And how should they believe in whom they have not heard? And how should they hear without a preacher? So that brings out the misconception about the most misunderstood scripture, the Matthew 20 and 28. What's that scripture, baby, that they getting one? Matthew 20 and 28 or 18, 20? My first scripture? 18, Matthew 18, 20. Thank you. Thank you so much. Matthew 18, 20, where two or three in the midst of them, I'm in the midst of them. No, I ain't talking about church. That's talking about getting situations resolved of conflict. Because the Bible says right here, how can they hear without a preacher? So does that scripture overmit this scripture? No. All the scriptures work together. Amen. Line upon line, precept upon precept. And when you go to church, you hear about faith. You hear about God's able to deliver you. You hear about God's able to make out your situation. God's able to give you a job. God's able to work out your depression. God's able to work out your anxiety. Your life ain't over. You don't have to take your life. God still has a plan for you. The Bible says, you are the apple of my eye. Amen. And it's not the will of God for someone to abuse you, beat you, put their hands on you, defile you. Hey, God has a plan and he loves you when you don't even love yourself. Amen. Amen. He was 10 and 20. It says, by the new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. What is he talking about? So in the Old Testament, they had the tabernacle. And the high priest would come in there, and he'll wash us, take the sacrifice, and take that blood. And there was a big old curtain veil, Kelly. Really big purple veil. And he would have to come through that. And you know, it was the holiest of holies. And you know, when the high priest went there, they had to put a chain around his ankle. And the holies of holies, only the high priest was able to go there once a year. And if he did something out of order the way God did not intend it to, God would have killed him instantly. And nobody could come in there and get him. They would have to drag his body out of there. So not everybody was able to get in the presence of God, only the high priest. So now it's saying that veil is took away in Christ. Now we can come boldly to the throne of grace and make our petition known up on high. We don't have to wait for the high priest to bring that sacrifice every year. We can come to the altar. We can get a hold of God. We don't have to wait on nobody. We can get everything we need to live for God. We can strap on the whole armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit. God wants God gave you everything you need in the Holy Ghost. You have to have the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost to be saved. You can't do it without the Holy Ghost. We need God. We need his power. We need his strength. We need his mind. And it's his will that all of us come to the fullness of the faith. God wants you believing on him, having faith through every situation that he is going to work it through. When you pray, you talk God, you got to believe he's going to answer your prayer. Pray and believe. Pray and believe. And receive what God has for you. We don't serve no handicapped God that can't do nothing. That can't save. That can't deliver. That can't make a way out of no way. That's what kind of God we serve. And if you need peace, you need joy, all you got to do in his presence is what? Fullness of joy. And at his right hand's pleasures forevermore. 
Don't start reaching in the world for your pleasures. You can get in God and get everything you need. Amen. Hebrews 10 and 20, by the living well, through the veil, through the same his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. When you're not living right, you're not doing things pleasing to God, your spirit is at, not at ease. Your spirit's troubled. You don't feel right because, you know, the Lord is coming. And he's coming like a thief in the night. He's coming quick. Amen. And the sad thing, a lot of us are not ready. Yeah. Come on. And it's time to get ready come on for his coming. Yes, come on. And he's looking for a church that has made their self ready yes. without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. God doesn't want a church that's defiled, living for the world, living an ungodly lifestyle. He wants someone that's consecrated, dedicated to him, that's looking for his coming, that are faithful to their God and no one else but their God. Amen. And our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. You know, one thing I want to uh, touch on real quick. The Bible says, unless you're born again, you can't go to heaven. Now we understand this. The Bible says, after that, those that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Now it's an endurance race. You have to endure to the end. You've got to keep walking with God. You've got to keep living for God. Now the Bible does say that no man can pluck you out of my hands. The only way he can pluck you out of hands is plucking you plucking yourself out of God's will. You can put yourself out of God's will by what? Being disobedient to his word. He said, my spirit should not always strive with man. God deals with us. He pulls at us. He reaches for us. But he said one time, he said, all day long have I stretched forth my hand to disobedient and gainsaying people, saying, this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. What does it say? Everybody that came out with Moses did not go into the promised land because some of their unbelief they got destroyed in the wilderness. Why? Because they refused to believe God. They had a lack of faith. What's that, um, sorry, what's that scripture that says you have to be born again in order to go to heaven? John 3 and 5. It says, unless a man is born again of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay. I think we talked about that. Amen. John 3 and 5. Uh -oh. Amen. Amen. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. He has eternal life for all of us. He has promised that you can be saved. He has promised a place in heaven for you. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to have the goodness of life. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to have good things in your life. He wants you to be blessed when you wake up, blessed when you go to sleep. He wants to see your family blessed. But the thing about it is, do you want to see yourself blessed? Are you willing to pay the price to be blessed? Are you willing? You know, if you want to be successful, you got to do stuff other people don't want to do. That's what it takes to be successful. you got to be doing what people don't want to do. you got to do things that are against the grain. you got to do things that aren't makes you uncomfortable, that are inconvenient to you. It's uncomfortable to get up early and pray. It's uncomfortable to read the word of God. It's uncomfortable to fast. But if you want to be successful in your walk with God, you got to do things that people are not willing to do. The normal saints aren't willing to do it. Come on. I came from church over 350 people. And I'm going to tell you what. When they used to have us come up front and say, how many people prayed out our day? You probably had 20, 30, 40 folks out of 340 people. And it's no, not talking bad, but I'm just saying, you got to be willing to do the stuff that normal people are not willing to do. you got to take care of yourself. You need to take care of your health. You need to exercise regularly. You need to do things. You need to put yourself on a schedule. You need to be that scary Christian word. It's called disciplined. We have to discipline ourselves. If we're not praying every day, guess what? We have a lack of discipline. If we're not reading the word of God every day, we have a lack of discipline. If we're not at least fasting one day a week, we have a lack of discipline. And the people that do not be disciplined are not going to make it to heaven. Why? Because they're not going to do what it takes. How can I prove that? The Bible says anything that can be shaken will be shaken. And only the things that cannot be shaken shall remain. Those are the people.
that are not going to get comfortable being lazy, living for God. And those that are going to endure when it gets hard, when you're racing, you're running, you're fighting. You're fighting the devil. You're fighting temptation. You're fighting everything this world has to offer against you. It doesn't get easy. You've got to have your mind made up. The Bible says, got my foot on the rock and my mind is made up. I'm not looking back. Jesus said that him that has his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. What is he saying? Hey, don't look back. There ain't nothing back there in the world. You know, I have that. I find out that guys that go to jail and go to prison and all that, all their friends kind of disappear when they really need them. Guy just got out of prison. He didn't have no friends he could call. Guess who he had to call? The preacher. No friends to help him. They help you when you hang out. They help you drink. They help you smoke dope. But when it comes time, you need somewhere to stay. Where are the friends at? Because guess what? They really don't care about you. They care about themselves. In closing, I hear my son, you know, it's about time to wrap this TV show up. Verse 24. It says, let us consider one another to provoke love and to good works. And let's love one another more. The Bible says, how are we going to know you, my disciples? You better have love for your brothers and sisters. Amen. Go out your way to be nice and kind to them. You know what they should be doing to me. No, you be the example. You don't have to wait on nobody. You know, they were talking about a story. There was a, there was a man, and uh, he got him a nice bass boat, Sean. And he was in, a, I think, like the North Dakota area. It was really cold and snowy. But he wanted something warmer, so he went to Florida. Went to Florida, Brandon. And his wife was with them. He was happy. He got to go fishing and doing all kind of great things out of the good weather. And a couple months later, a guy approached him and said, what's going on? He said, we're moving. He said, you're moving? I thought that's what you wanted. He said, I do, but my wife isn't happy. See, your wife's not happy. He said, you know what? When my wife came here, the women of the city haven't received her. They haven't spent no time with her. They haven't hanged out with her. And he said, well, has your wife, and they haven't invited her to do anything? He said, well, has your wife let them know that she's interested in doing them things? He said, well, no, I guess she wasn't. She was sitting on the wait for them to come to her. He said, you know what? Since she was waiting on feeling them to come to her, they took her as being a brown recruit. So they felt that's what she wanted. So what you got to understand the moral of that story is you get what you give. You reap what you sow. If you want, the Bible says, him that has friends must show himself friendly. It's, it don't take much to make people happy nowadays. You smile them, say hi. How are you doing today? It's good to see you. You know how that makes someone's day? You come up and say, when someone just talked to for a couple minutes, when someone talked to you for a couple minutes, doesn't that make your day? Yes. It don't take much to make somebody happy. You can put a smile on somebody's face. You never know. You never know that they might be battling depression where they feel that nobody loves them and they're ready to blow their brains out. And you come by and say, I love you. I appreciate you. It's going to be all right. God's going to help us. We're going to make it through. You don't know how that just makes their day. I tell the story one Sunday. I had a mechanic, Brandon. I went to buy to get my car fixed. I said, man, it's good to see you. How's things going? Man, I appreciate how you fixed my car. Not even knowing. My cousin came by and said, you know what? Joseph just came by my house. I'm about to blow my brains out. <laughs> but I realized someone loved me. Someone cared about me. He told me he was about to kill him. He told my cousin he was about to kill himself. He was about to go in there, take a gun, blow his brains out. But he realized someone really cared about him. Just because I took that time out to say hi. How you doing? Be nice and kind to somebody. Go out your way to be a blessing to somebody. You want to see this church full? You start loving your neighbors. Start loving people you're around. Go and talk to them. Say hi to them. Find them for some coffee. You know, if you're single, bring somebody with you because they might be thinking something. We got, we got some crazy folks up there. You're a pretty little girl. You invite somebody to my house. You might not come out. There's a whole lot of haters out there. You got to be careful, you know. We can't put it past nobody because not everybody's working with a full deck of cards. <laughs> Praise God. I'm excited. Uh, we're going to do an offering. Uh, Sean, take this uh, mic to Bob. She's going to talk about the women's encounter thing that's going to be coming up. And we have a little offering. If you'd like to give an offering, 
And she's going to talk a little bit about women abuse. Hey, everybody. Um, talk to some people here. God's great. God's real great. Um, I haven't been here in church because I've been going to another church. I'm working with abused women. Um, we've got Women's Encounter coming up again, October 8th, 9th, and 10th. It's going to be a great weekend. You can just go out there and just have fun and worship God and be loved on. And you ain't got to worry about paying. It'll be paid for you. If you went like the second time, then you have to pay for it. But your first time is on a scholarship. And it's a great thing. It's just a great weekend just to be with God and, and worship and just have a good time. Talk, talk a little bit about the women you saw women. Um, Joseph, Pastor Joseph came out for the other day, and we were talking about, um, these women that I had seen over there, they have, they were beat up really bad, where they were in a wheelchair, and, you know, there's a lot of abuse going on right there, out, right now, a lot of abuse going on, I mean, with this COVID going on, it's having, you know, the guys ain't having a job out there, and then they want to beat up their women. I mean, there's a lot of abuse out there, a lot of abuse. And, I mean, it's really sad. And hopefully I can bring these women from here into church, and so. Amen. Hey, Brandon, bring that up for me. Thank you, sir. And uh, they had talked about that even domestic violence and cases have went up on a, a high, high note. Very high. Because men don't understand that we need to get on our knees and call on God. It's never an answer to beat up on your wife, to hit another person because things are not going your way. Take frustration out on your family, your loved ones. It's time to get on your knees and reach out to God. Because God's the answer in this last day. Amen. So come to Sunday morning. Who's going to bring a visitor with them? That's all I got. Raise your hand if you're going to bring a visitor. All right. Who's going to bring the most visitors? Chris, you going to bring a visitor? <laughs> all you do is say, hey, man, why don't you come to church with me? Ain't that hard? We'll let you bring you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're going to close this. We love y'all. We're praying for y'all. Let God have his way in your lives. I'm telling you, if you really start living for God, it will blow you away what God does with your life. The sky's the limit. The sky's the limit. When I used to sit in church, Brandon, I never imagined God would do what he'd done in my life. Amen. Never imagined it would happen. But little by little, I just kept living for God, kept being faithful, kept putting God as a priority in my life, and God has opened doors that I never imagined. Yeah. Hey, and the Bible says that he is no respecter of persons. If he did it for me, he sure can do it for you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you Sunday.